Hello everyone and welcome. Uh, welcome to this conversation with Hannah Fry. Hannah is Professor in the Mathematics of Cities. Uh, she is currently about 300 miles away in Glasgow, uh, but with any luck, the wonders of Zoom will work for us. I'm sure we're going to be talking about algorithms and risk. And I just want to say a little thing about risk um, as we get going. And that is uh, life is risky. It may be COVID, it may be cancer, or in my case, falling over, hitting my head on a pavement and getting a rather strange lot of bruising on my face. So if you're wondering why my face looks quite so odd, that's why. Hannah, welcome. Thank you for agreeing to do this. Um, and let's start off with a bit about your early life. Um, trying to work out why you became a, a mathematician of cities. <laughs> So, so am I, to be honest, <laughs> to be perfectly frank. Um, I think that it was, um, I, I sort of think that I didn't know that I was going to be a mathematician until I was one. Um, I think that what happened was that at every ste step of the way, uh, I just knew I wasn't quite done with it yet. I knew that I was still really enjoying it. And I, and I knew that um, I wasn't ready to walk away. And that kept happening really until the end of my PhD, um, when I, uh, I had an ambition to go and work in Formula One, um, which I succeeded in and, I, and then it turns out I hated it. Um, so um, it, as I was looking to escape that world, um, I mean, all sorts of reasons why I hated it. I, can, I, I, I mean, I could literally talk for an hour on that. Um, but the uh, as I was trying to escape this, job came up, the postdoctoral um, position came up, and it was with uh, a group of academics who I'd known and collaborated with before. And it was, this is in 2010, and it was in this kind of new fangled idea of using data and sensors to try and model patterns in human behavior. And there'd been like a little bit of this uh, that had been going on already, but it was still a very new and emerging field because the 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 data was only just becoming available and so um i took the job really as just a sort of let's just find something to do and then it turned out actually being in an area at sort of the the the, the birth of it almost i mean not not quite the birth of it but but really the, the, the this moment of explosion was actually just a really exciting time where you had just an incredible amount of freedom of thought um and the different subjects that you could tap into well, we'll come back to what what it is that you actually do later, but perhaps we can start going back to your your school days. Um, you presumably had good maths teaching at your school in order not to turn you off, at least. Oh yeah, and actually, so I there was one um, a couple of years ago. I uh, did a project where I got to interview loads of PhD students, maths PhD students across London. Um, across all the London universities, major London universities, and universally, every single person who was doing a maths PhD had one maths teacher who had made a big difference to them. And I think, so from that moment on, I've tried to like ask as many academics as I can, and I think it's absolutely universal across the board. Mine was uh, a woman called Mrs. Andrews. She, um, I had her in year seven, and I ended up having her all the way through to year 13. Um, and she very sadly died a few years ago, but she was just, uh, I can't, I don't know. She, she just never made you feel like a fool. Um, she was just very encouraging. And I think that she, um, well, just gave me the sort of nurturing environment that I needed to find a subject that I loved. And you were at an old girl's school, I think. Yeah. <laughs> how, how relevant is that? So was I, I went to a girl's school. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I like my, how I feel about girls' schools changes over time. So, I was at a girls' school. I had two sisters as well, and both uh, my parents are uh, were very strict. Um, I uh, discovered recently that my cousins used to call us the Amish um, <laughs> because of how strict we were, <laughs> which uh, I think was actually pretty accurate, to be honest. <laughs> But um, so they were basically, we were not allowed to have any contact with any boys at all, right, at all. Um, 
it was like uh, my dad and the priest, and that was the only male, males that we were that we were ever allowed to speak to. So I think in that environment, actually, I think that that it, I found it very suffocating, um, and I found it difficult because the things that I tended to like, like motor racing, and like um, I don't know, uh, like um, rap music, and um, and mathematics, and engineering, and those, and and computers, they tend to be quite male things. Um, and so I found it really hard to form those strong bonds in an environment where I only had females to, to choose from, really. Um, so I did really struggle quite a lot at school, actually. I really, I really hated it. And I hated it even when I was in sort of my 20s and so on. Looking back on it, I really, um, it wasn't a good experience for me. But on the but, other hand, if you go to a co-ed school and the boys say to you, that's not a girl's subject. That is also an enormous deterrent. I mean, one of my colleagues in Cambridge who had a daughter who was then about 10 or something said, her teacher had said, you do maths like a boy. And I, don't, I have no idea what that means, but, but it was not meant to be encouraging to that girl, was it? <laughs> um, no, so, no, and I think this is, this, is such an, this is such an important point actually, because I think, um, I mean, I think even when you're insulated from that, that outside world, I still think that if you are a girl who does maths, I think over and over and over again, every interaction you have with a stranger, with a friend, whatever, when they find out that it's like, this is a girl who does maths, their reaction is always some form of, oh, a girl who does maths. And then I think what happens when you get to PhD level or above and the maths gets really hard because it does, right? Like there's no way around it. It's really difficult. I think that where is all the boys leading up to that point in time, you know, if they say I'm doing maths, the reaction is like, oh, you must be really clever. All of the boys, um, uh, certainly of my students, uh, and I mean, I've noted this more broadly, the boys are sort of like, well, okay, of course it's hard. The maths is hard, I'm clever. Whereas the girls having had years and years and years and years of people being surprised that they are the ones that are there, they really internalize it. And they're like, it's hard because I don't belong here. It's hard because I'm not supposed to be here. Um, and so, I mean, I think you're right. It's like, it's sliding doors really, isn't it? Had I gone to a co-ed school, would I have ended up in the same position? And I mean, there's there's no real way of knowing really. Um, I think there's kind of good good and bad sides. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and what's the solution? I mean, is it the girls' fault for internalizing that they can't be good at maths because they're struggling or I, I mean I, in a way I thought what you were going to say is that the boys who suddenly find it hard actually weren't expecting it and therefore oh. internalized that and struggled I mean that definitely happens too I agree with that that definitely happens too a, a massive a massive confidence wobble that you can't just not do any work or whatever no I agree yeah. with that um in terms of um, in terms of how you fix it or what you should change about it. I mean, I just sort of think in a way we are, we are existing in a system that was designed to reward one particular type of student. You know, I, I really think this is like, I, I don't teach undergraduates anymore, but when, when I taught undergraduates, it's like to get yourself noticed in an undergraduate lecture theater, you have to be quite, um, loud <laughs> um, really proactive um very like good at being sort of charming you have to uh, when it comes to exam times you have to be incredibly good at like operating under pressure um you know being quick and so on and i think that in a lot of ways it's like we we're sort of expecting people to step into this for want of a better word kind of white man shaped hole and perform just as well and I, and I kind of wonder whether actually you know like phds the way that phd is structured it i mean it breaks everybody like when i first have a phd student the first meeting i have is like there will be a day when you when you hit that wall and it's horrendous and just know that this is going to happen but but why should it be that way why should it be that this kind of you know it has to be somebody with unshakable self-confidence yeah. and, and of course it doesn't have to be it's not just boys are confident men are confident and women aren't I mean there are lots of men who will struggle in that 
you know, they may be the right kind of shape, but not internally. And I think you're right. And I think it applies all the way up the academic ladder, actually, that there is a certain kind of person who the system was designed for. And it's really hard to change that in promotion structures or whatever, going to conferences. You know, why do you want to stand up and give a talk in a conference? I mean, not everyone is going to be good at that. Um, and we, we do have a fairly narrow range of things that lead to reward in a way that is utterly unhelpful for diversity of thinking. I agree, I agree. And I think I think if we're being honest with ourselves here, both you and I are sort of that character, right? We're surely not. No, no. <laughs> no I well, think both of us are quite headstrong, quite, you know, um, like willing to stand up in front of an audience. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't get shy about sort of oral presentations. Um, and like both of us you, you, you don't get shy internally even I mean I, I was really struck by talking to a senior woman not a not a mathematician or a physicist who referred to a male we both knew oh well he's so confident and you know I'm not was her view and I was thinking that's not the perception you give and I know perfectly well this male is not self-confident we all just play this game but you're saying you're not playing the game you actually believe it Oh, no, 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 I'm definitely playing the game. <laughs> I am definitely playing the game, believe me. I have, I have my tactic um, is that uh, what I do is I say yes to things. And then as soon as you've said yes to it, then you're essentially on an unstoppable train and there's no way out. Um, so I think that the, the real moment of bravery is saying yes. And then after that, you, you have no choice. And it's, is that what you feel about all your media work, for instance? A hundred percent. Honestly, I can't tell you how... <laughs> there are some things, I probably shouldn't be admitting this in front of quite so many people, but there are some things that I do in my uh, media side of things, which, um, I mean, everything feeds into itself, right? So that you do one thing, which on the surface doesn't really look like it's kind of contributing to my overall ambition of trying to just make the subject that I really love seem a bit more friendly and a bit more human. So there are some things that don't necessarily seem like they fit into that bigger picture, but one door opens another and so on. But there are some aspects of the things that I do that I cannot tell you how much I hate it. <laughs> like, it does not make me happy at all. Um, the entire experience is absolutely horrific, but you just, I think it's just like the brave thing is saying yes. And then after that, you've got no choice. But you can hate things for many reasons. They could be boring rather than terrifying. Yeah, these are terrifying. <laughs> okay, okay. Would you like to share some of this? Never go on Have I Got News For You. That's, I think that's Never do what? Have I Got News For You is so oh. terrifying. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. I, I think any of these things where you are, you need to be quick witted mm. and there's an audience of millions. Yeah. But if you say something wrong, there yeah. are four professional comedians ready to jump on. <laughs> yes. But have you done question time or any of these more? I have. Time? I have done question time. And actually, question time wasn't. Um, it, I mean, I was, I was still terrified, obviously, on question time. But I think the thing about question time is that actually it's just, you don't need to be anything other than who you are, you know? Like the audience aren't there to, I think if you go on as a politician, then the audience are yes. there to get answers but from There's you. always one who isn't the politician, yes. Yeah, yeah. Whereas I think if you go on there as someone like me, it's like, I don't, I mean, I'm very sort of lucky that I'm not broadly considered a hate figure, right? And like people are sort of on your side, right? You know, right. the audience is behind you. And so I think all you need to do is make some intelligent um, comments about what's going on and that's it. And then, and actually I, that, that sort of feels like I'm chaff. I can, I can kind of do that. That's not, I'm slightly obsessed with politics anyway. So it's not, not uh, particularly okay. difficult. Okay, so have I got news for you is, is a scarier thing. I, I mean, it's interesting because Mary Beard, who I've talked to about question time and things, she's had some really bad experiences, although she yeah. says exactly what you say as the non-politician, it is different. But she did, yeah. she did get a lot of probably real hate mail on after one appearance. Um, yeah, I, 
yeah, I don't understand why. Uh, you know, I just say something about society rather than about Mary Beard, I think. I, I, yes, I think that's absolutely right. We seem to have gone rapidly from school to your media career. We probably should fill it in a bit. Um, so, I'm a terrible viewing, forgive me. <laughs> so, you fell into maths without actually quite intending to do it. You really wanted to do Formula One. Did you ever want to be a Formula One driver? No, because no, I mean, partly, I think I think I fit into the stereotype of a mathematician and I'm just incredibly uncoordinated in every regard, bad at sport, okay. bad at dance. So that, that <laughs> so, wasn't, what, wasn't no. the reason. So, so no. what was it about Formula One then? So my dad and his brother used to race motorbikes professionally. So we've always, our family is, is, is very sort of, racing oriented and I know my I have two sisters and I know that my dad would have loved to have a, a boy and I think if he'd had a boy he would have taken him down the cart track and uh you know and raced around and and and, and whatnot and uh it wasn't ever that I objected to that because it's not something I ever would have been particularly good at but I think that um it just I just mm, the thing is about Formula One is it's kind of a giant maths competition. <laughs> like the, from the design of the cars to like the strategic game theory elements, there's just all kinds of components to it that are just, I think, really, really fascinating and incredibly technical. And I just like that detail. I've always really liked that detail and that precision um, and sort of an endless pit that you can swim in almost. Um, so that was it, really. It was it was sort of uh, the racing background, but then the, the real maths angle. So why did you hate it when you ah. actually got into it? <laughs> oh, God. OK, so um, right. For starters, uh, I was working as an errors analysis and um, there were uh, there was no other women in the building at all. In fact, they um, they didn't have a women's toilet. They had uh, they had a disabled toilet, which became mine when I was in the building. But I think the main thing I think if I had gone now, um, I think that now that uh, places like that have recognised that they have a problem with sort of um, gender. Um, I mean, bias, really. It's sort of the same thing we were saying before. It's like that whole environment is set up for one type of person to succeed. And if you go in as a sort of outsider, somebody who, who who's not in that world, doesn't have experience of that world, and it's like you're, you're sort of sink or swim, really. And I just sank. I just, I just it, it's so competitive, the environment. People are really, um, there's not this sort of collaborative spirit like there had been in academia. But also, I think that just in terms of how intellectually demanding it was, I think that I'd really expected, I had this like fantasy of, in my head of that it would be quite a lot, you know, a lot like a, a, a maths room, right? Where it's like there's chalkboards and there's, you know, like the Newton Institute in Cambridge, right? I, I genuinely thought it would be like that, you know, people writing up equations and, and people contributing and, and lots of discussion and big ideas. And it just wasn't. I mean, everything is about the race. And so it has to happen as quickly as possible. And it's the ugliest solution you can find as long as it's quick. And it's, you know, really, it's, it's really about setting up runs on your computer and then coming in in the morning and, and, and picking the picture that's got the least amount of blue on it, really. And, and I just didn't find that intellectually stimulating in the way that I had wanted it to be. And so it wasn't worth all of the other stuff. Right. So, so I was going to say you started off and it was the environment. Yeah. And of course, environment is hugely important. But if you've been fired up by the, the problem solving, you might have yeah. stuck it out. I think that's right. I think that's right. Yeah. So how long did you stick it out? Oh, God, almost no time at all. I, 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 I mean, the scarf was back in a few months. <laughs> OK. And then you just fell back into academia without quite intending to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's never quite happened. <laughs> I mean, you could have gone off and done something totally different. You could have gone into the city, for instance. When I you're... know. I think I, I know. And um, okay, I just I have I think that there are some really fascinating mathematical problems in the city, um, but I also think that I don't know. I just I, I I'm just motivated more by other objectives. Um, and uh, yeah, I, so I, it just was, it was never going to be for me, the city. I mean, from what you're saying, people are very important in your life, the interactions with yeah. other people. And I don't think the city is particularly good at that either. I mean, it is a similar kind of um, world of sharks. 
perhaps. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. I think that's uh, fair to say. So how much do people feature in your current life? I mean, the, the collaborations, the, the standing in front of a whiteboard and scribbling away. And having big ideas. Um, so they do, they do a lot. Um, but I would say that um, COVID, well, okay, so I think there's been three things that have happened in quick succession that have meant that um, the sort of the really juicy maths that I, I that's my favorite thing have taken more of a backseat. So the first was having two children in quick succession. Um, then the pandemic knocked a, a lot of, you know, the collaborative work out, was a, which I'm sure was the, the case for everybody in those early months. And then last year I was very sick, um, which kind of knocked everything back again. So I think that this year, now the world's opening up again. Um, I mean, I still have PhD students and things and still have uh, still have master's students and dissertations and, and whatnot. So still like in the university. But I think that um, it's, uh, yeah, it's been a few years where uh, I've been doing less of that than I like. I think for many, many people, myself included, that lack of contact in any mm -hmm sort of relaxed way if you like I mean talking over zoom I would so much rather you were here in Cambridge and you yeah. know, we could have a, a drink afterwards sort of thing it, it's it's a very different kind of experience and I think there's an enormous weariness and having two children sort of gives you no energy for anything so <laughs> apart that one but I mean well, it, I, I also think though I also think I mean if you look at sort of the the, the research projects that I have um you know been involved in they, that, like, I like to describe myself as intellectually promiscuous um, in the sense that I really like the idea of um, creating these mathematical models, particularly that are about space and time and, and movement and, and, and change. Um, but the thing is, is that the subject areas themselves actually are quite disparate. So um, there's uh, uh, some work in there looking at uh, badgers, for example, so looking at um, how effective badger culls are. Um, there's some other work looking at burglaries, um, there's some work looking at riots, some work looking at shopping, some work, I, I did some collaborations with some archaeologists at one point. And the thing is, is that the, the, the mathematical techniques that underlie all of those actually have some real similarities, but the subjects themselves feel like they're quite far apart. And the reason for that is because I think that's the way that I work best, is when it's a really collaborative environment where there are people with different expertise who are... Um, where there's sort of overlap. I, I mean, I really like the interdisciplinary idea of research. Um, and so, and therefore it's gonna take an inevitably take a big hit during something like the pandemic. Yes, I, I think it's fine if you've got collaborations already mm -hmm. running, but very hard to, to build new ones. I mean, we had a discussion in college last week about um, interdisciplinary working and it takes time to build that relationship. If you're coming, you know, if you've got a badger expert and a mathematician, yeah, finding the common language even is, is quite a challenge. Um, I agree. Yeah, I agree. I mean, their, their knowledge of differential equations or, you know, or whatever may be, may be limited. It's quite limited. <laughs> As, uh, they never got to Stokes there. I mean, what, like, so, you know. Oh, shocking. <laughs> but then what do you know about badgers? <laughs> almost nothing <laughs> right <laughs> so we have to respect other people we have to trust other people right, right. When we, when we, I mean I, I've always worked in a, a rather similar way of you know being very interdisciplinary um, so it's not for nothing that for my sins I chair the ref interdisciplinary advisory panel but that's probably not something to be very proud of um, because ref is not usually mentioned in polite circles in universities um, <laughs> Now I know who I need to butter up next time round there, that's it. Uh... Ah, well, I'm not sure I'll do it again. Uh, <laughs> so, but, but I mean, well, we could have a long conversation about interdisciplinary working because, I mean, that remark indicates that you feel you are disadvantaged because you're working in an interdisciplinary area. Um, and I suspect for many people that can be the case. Now, your department, which um, I did write down what it was called, um, the Centre for Advanced Spatial Analysis. Thank you. I mean, that, that is not, it's not a silo, it's not a maths department, it's not a computing department. I mean, so that is quite interesting. Yeah. Um, and I think yeah. UCL has quite a lot of those kinds of things. It does, it does. And the thing is, is that they, they often collaborate with each other. So that, I think, has been the source of lots of really... Um, really fruitful ideas and really fruitful research because within the department we have 
there are some architects, there are, um, uh, you know, there are lots of physicists, lots of mathematicians, lots of computer scientists, um, but, you know, people like town planners, right, or like um, philosophers and social scientists and, and all of these different kind of people that, um, that end up coming together. And, and I think they're really, if it's, um, I think that so much of where we are going um, in terms of the way that science is embedding itself in society, I actually think that these kind of approaches aren't just like fruitful from a sort of intellectual point of view, but I also think that they're, they're sort of essential. Um, I think that you can't make real progress in silos in perhaps the way that you could have done 100 years ago. I totally agree. I, I mean, Cambridge is still quite siloed. You have to, you, have to, you are attached to a traditional department, be it physics or maths or whatever, but that doesn't at all stop you getting out and about, as it were. But I think UCL I, I mean, the, the Institute of Making, I think it's rather similar. Um, and I, I don't know, do you have a, a, a traditional department as well? So that you go no. and teach in maths or something? No, so we teach, I teach on master's courses um, in, in CASA uh, and PhD students there. Um, I still, I mean, I think just inevitably given that I am a mathematician. I have all sorts of ties with the math department and the statistics department. It's just kind of inevitable that everybody sort of has an unofficial home. In fact, I think I may be honorary over there, but you well, know, well, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. but yeah, officially it's, it's in the department. And so, I mean, not only is UCL, I think, very different from Cambridge, but they also would seem to have a very different a sort of attitude, as it were, to outreach, public engagement, all the things that you, know, you are probably most famous for, as it were, being out and about. Um, I know several years ago, I interviewed Helen Chesky, who is also at UCL, probably in the physics department, but I may be wrong. Um, and you know, Helen is a, a Churchill alum, so we're very proud of her. But I mean, again, she has managed to have a very successful academic career while writing books, as you do, appearing on the TV, as you do, what is it about the UCL atmosphere that makes that so feasible? Do you think things are changing elsewhere, though? Do well, I think, think they're changing, but UCL right. seems further ahead. Yeah. Um, OK, so uh, what do I think? I think a couple of I think for starters, it's quite helpful that we're literally around the corner from the BBC. And so it's just it just ends up that, you know, you end up being known by them. Mm. Um, so that I think is weirdly quite helpful. But I also think that actually UCL took some steps uh, quite a few years ago, really, to, um, to try and reward this stuff officially. So our promotions um, procedure takes into account things like outreach, things like, um, things like public engagement, but also they have a series of provost awards every year and have done for a number of years. And I think they just try and, uh, you know, it takes a little bit of time, really, but I think making that indication uh, very clearly that actually this is something that's important. And, and I do I do really think it is, you know, I mean, I know it depends where you sit on the spectrum. And, and of course, not everybody, not every academic is like going to, I don't know, write a book or go on. Have I got this view? Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> but but I do think that across the whole spectrum of things, I think that actually a lot of you know the work that we're doing is publicly funded and i actually think that that we have a responsibility to spend time and effort communicating that to the public it doesn't mean that everybody has to do it but i think that um it that that, that old attitude of i had a professor during my undergraduate degree who said the world fears mathematicians let's keep it that way um and <laughs> And I think that kind of old attitude is like, actually, I, I think that's really problematic and I, and, I, and I don't like it at all. And so and so I think that, um, yeah, I think it's quite positive that, that there are, that yeah. the is changing. I just realised Lucy Green is also UCL, isn't she? It is. We've got a little collection. <laughs> You've got a little collection of stellar women. I mean, it's interesting. Uh, who, who are the equivalent men? I'm, uh... <laughs> We've got Sophie Scott, too. I mean, to oh, yeah. the list. Um, and Mark Mirdovnik. Well. Of course, Mark, yes. Yes, I was referring to the Institute of Making. Oh, man. Mark. Um, no, it, it's, it's very interesting. How did you get into this? Oh, it was accidental. Completely, completely accidental. So um, I was doing my postdoc and um, there is this sort of academics comedy night. I don't know if you've come across it. It's called Bright Club. Oh, yes, I've heard and, of it. Um, 
uh, it was when it very first started in London. I think London was one of the ones, that, the first um, places to do it. And I think essentially the thing about Bright Club is that um, the um, standard is quite low. <laughs> so you would only have to be like, okay, to really stand out as quite good. But but the, the idea behind Bright Club is it's not sort of like, let's do a really hilarious comedy night. It's more that when you take academics and you ask them to speak about their work, they tend up, they, they tend to fall into the same old patterns of like, here's a PowerPoint slide and I'm just gonna talk at you. And the thing about saying, no, 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 you have to make it into a comedy, um, you know, five minute comedy story or whatever. It just forces people to completely throw everything that they know out the window and start from scratch. It's kind of quite a useful technique. Um, and so uh, I just, one of my friends was doing it and they wanted me to do it with them. So I was like, okay, fine, I'll do it. Anyway, it turned out that somebody in the audience that day asked me to go and do another talk. Uh, which I did, which was filmed and went on the internet and it went sort of a little like mini viral. And then um, someone who was watching that invited me to New York to do a talk. Um, and that was a talk that I gave. I was just mucking around really, but I did, gave a talk called The Mathematics of Love, um, which was actually some quite legitimate mathematical techniques um, that applied to dating. And that went super, 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 super viral, um, had something crazy like a few eight million views or something in total um, and really I think that was the starting point of where people then started coming to me and asking me to do things so again it was an accident but you then find yeah. you were quite good at it I mean life is full of accidents isn't it mm -hmm. it's all about luck or unluck it is and not unluck <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah or unluck <laughs> yeah was that, was that a question I can answer <laughs> go ahead yeah so last year my unluck last year um was that uh almost exactly a year ago in fact um i found out i had cervical cancer and it was a routine smear test that caught it um and the timing of it it was yeah i've been filming a, I'm, I'm making a film about um cancer at the moment with bbc so i've literally been talking about cancer all day <laughs> so I'm going to be in one of those situations where I can't remember whether I've said something to you or to on, on camera. But um, yeah, it was it, the thing is, is that the main thing about the diagnosis was that it was a, it was um, it looked really bad for a while. There was it was on the cusp. It, we knew it was in my lymph, lymphatic system, basically, and, and how established it was would make a really big difference to my chances of survival. So I had some very radical surgery, which took me out for a little while. Um, and then as I came through the other side, um, you know, I, and, and I got lucky, basically, I got lucky that um, it hadn't established and we were able to remove everything. And, and now I, there's a chance cancer, the cancer will come back, but um, at the moment, I don't have any detectable cancer. Um, but the, the big thing about it, really, the thing I've been thinking about a lot in the last year, is just about the decisions that you're, you're asked to make in that moment of where, of where you're no longer talking about numbers as though they're objective facts. You're talking about them as though they're these really genuinely terrifying predictions about your own future. And it feels very, very different um, in that scenario. Because, you know, in my normal life, I can talk about probability with the best of them, but, you know, 90% chance of something happening, I sort of assume it's it's 100%, right? 10%, so I forget it, it doesn't yeah. matter. Whereas suddenly, you know, the chance of my cancer coming back now is one in 10. And suddenly, rather than it being like 10% is nothing, suddenly it's like there's 10 people in a lineup and one person's getting shot. You know, it's, it's, it's very, very different. And I think that when you try and communicate that risk to people who are in that situation where they're terrified, like genuinely terrified for their life, that is a really, really tricky clash between what it is to be human and the things that we care about and the things that we're scared about and trying to communicate a very, very difficult idea, a very, very difficult and often quite technical idea. And I don't think in having made this film over the last year and spoken to lots and lots of people about it, I don't think that we're getting it right. And I don't think that a lot of people who are having cancer care are really being given the opportunity to make a truly informed decision about what happens to them. But do you think you can make an informed decision? I because I mean, what, what is an epidemiological fact as it were? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I had my own trivial by comparison equivalent when 
I was having some tests done and it wasn't about cancer. And I was told, well, you can have this procedure done and there's a 10% chance of death, but a 60% chance of success and a 30% chance of it doing absolutely nothing. And I was just thinking, I have no idea how to weigh this up. As it turned out, they misdiagnosed the problem anyhow, and none of that was relevant. But it really brought me up short, exactly the same thing. I am not a statistic. And I just don't know how you can provide the right information. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I think, I, you know, I think it's really, really hard. And I think actually in a weird way, I think once a, um, once you get to the stage where, okay, I think this problem exists the whole way through. I think it happens with screening. I think it happens with um, something they call adjuvant therapy, which is basically chemotherapy essentially, um, or, or uh, after you've had surgery. And I think it also happens with terminal diagnosis. And I think that really maybe the question isn't, um, oh, what percentage do you want to go for? I think the question is, what is important to you right now? And how can we best help you to achieve that? Because, of course, if there's a moment where you say, you know, what's really important to me right now is actually, I don't want to live with this, this cloud or this thing hanging over me. I don't, I don't want that to happen. Um, and that would perhaps be a different treatment to, um, I really care about my mobility. And I am prepared to go for more scans and go for more tests if it means that I increase the chances of, of, uh, of, of holding onto my mobility. I'm giving you like sort of really detailed things here, but also not detailed because, <laughs> because I've been talking about it all day. You can ask me more in the Q&A if you want to. If you want to yes, I, I mean, that's a good point. We will stop in about 10 minutes to have Q&A. So audience, please um, put your questions down before you forget them. Um, Yes, I mean, the kinds of things I'm sure went through your mind, you had two small children. Mm. Um, you know, you do a lot to, to see more of them kind of thing. Yeah, of course. Whereas if you're, you're 70, you may feel, I'm not prepared to have aggressive surgery. Yeah, just, so it's about the individual person yeah. at that point in time. Um, I think that for me, I mean, this is something that we kind of explore a bit in the film, but... Um, I'm giving away so much detail of my own. Well, you'll just get everyone queuing up to watch it, right? <laughs> so true. Basically, they they did this really radical surgery where they took out all of the, the lymph nodes in my pelvis because they were like, let's go for the low risk option. And the result of that is I now have this condition that, that um, is called lymphedema, which essentially can put you in a wheelchair. And looking back on it, actually, because I made the decision in a bit of a blur, because it was all a bit of a, you know, a, like what I don't know what to do, just do whatever you need to do, just do it. Um, I think actually a, a slightly calmer approach would have meant that um, I wouldn't necessarily need to be in the position I'm in now. Right. Those, those are the kind of things I'm exploring. Okay, today. so it is a very personal evaluation <laughs> of, of how, how this is. But it's not, but it is, but it is, uh, I just want to be clear, it's not, it's not self-pitying um, and it's not, um, it's not solely focused on me either. It's, it's really, no, no. I think, using that as a way to, I think, talk about cancer care more generally um, in the UK and, but also about that really difficult problem of taking, as you said, right, an epidemiological view of a population and then trying to interpret it as an individual person and try and work out what that means for you as, as the individual. So my story really, um, compared to the other stories in the programme, is not is not in, remotely interesting, but I think it's just a, a way in. Absolutely. Um, and do you think, I mean, I know you do a lot of work with algorithms and deep mind, and um, do you think there is a way that machine learning or AI or anything can help make those decisions better? Because part of what you're saying is the way the personal that doctor or you know specialist tells you these things mm. but is there a way that we could come up with an optimum answer based on algorithms no i don't i don't think there is i mean i i don't think there is and the reason for that is because i think that sometimes i think that maths and numbers and data and so on um actually really struggle to describe what's most important. Um, I wrote a piece in the New Yorker about this actually, about sort of the, the, the tyranny of numbers when you, when you use them to try and define things, when you use them as a proxy for what you really care about. 
and I think that this is one of those situations. I mean, it's kind of exactly what you were saying, right? They said there's a 30% chance of this. They said there's a this percent mm. chance of this. But actually, the conversation should have been one that didn't involve numbers necessarily, but said, what is it that you care about? Yeah. Tell me about your life and what matters to you. Um, and so for that, I really don't think that we're in a world where algorithms can, can help. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be some people who try. <laughs> because, yeah. but, but I think that I think the algorithms tend to actually, you know what, there's really brilliant. I had this brilliant conversation with this guy called Jeff Bolgan. He said something really clever. Um, this is like a couple of years ago. So I'm, uh, and I haven't thought about it for at least a year. So I'm not going to half remember it. But he said that um, in every culture that's ever existed, there has been some idea of wisdom as a way to be really taken the context and the nuance of the situation and to give a solution that really understands exactly the environment that you're in. And actually the way that out, that sort of one end of the spectrum is like perfectly specialized. And actually the way that, that we have built algorithms and artificial intelligence is exactly over the other end of the spectrum. It's like repetition and parroting and everything, trying to fit in everything into, into discrete categories so that everything could be treated in a similar way. And actually those two things are so far mm -hmm. apart from one another. And we really kind of focus down this this one end, and I and I I I I, I think that's um, that's actually quite a good description of of, um, of of this situation. I mean, it's the typical thing of what can you measure, mm. as opposed to the qualitative analysis. The what do you value? Because you know, economists who want to put a value on trees is, is one of my sort of things. I find it quite hard to get my head around. I understand that you know natural capital how do how do we evaluate it but the idea that you have to turn it into pounds shillings and pence sorry that's a very old-fashioned <laughs> way of I'm thinking sure. about it um but but you know it's really hard to put an absolute value on something as well, a tree's not intangible but you, you know what i mean and i think what you're saying is rather the same thing that that, that value is very different from percentage odds yeah it, it really is it really is and i think I think that actually this is something, um, I mean, I've written a lot about this, but I think this is something that um, has really been problematic over the last decade where the rise of data and the rise of algorithms and artificial intelligence and so on to, to, to automate decision making um, has occurred, which is that I think that um, the people who have done best or, or, or who have made the most progress are the ones who understand the power of those things, but really also understand their limitations. And I think the limitations are exactly as you're describing. So before we wrap up, I would like to talk a tiny bit about algorithms. We haven't got very long, but but the, I mean, bias is one very obvious problem with these. And in a way, what you're saying is a different kind of bias. I mean, I was thinking of you know skin color and face recognition or whatever. But but um, there is also the problem of bias because you are not weighting things the way someone else would weight them yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah i mean i think this yeah uh, to, like totally um but also i think a bias that pops up just by virtue of the fact that you will only ever be able to use proxies for the things that you really care about that um that by trying to distill the world into numbers you have to take shortcuts and then you end up leaving gaps between them so let me give you an example of one um that i'm talking about here because uh, I think that people know that things like racial bias um, or gender bias and all of these different kinds of biases arise, right? And people have been thinking of them as they're, they're, they're these technical problems with technical workarounds. You just fiddle the, the data and then, and then you're fine, right? Like add another, get another algorithm to solve it. But there was one particularly um, famous example of a, of a health algorithm. This is in uh, America. So in America, if you're particularly sick, there is a, a funded program where you can get a healthcare coordinator to um, speak to all your different healthcare providers and, and coordinate everything for you. Um, and uh, you have to qualify for this program. So what they do is they feed in health records of like hundreds of millions of people and they rank them. And if you're over the 97th percentile, then you're automatically defaulted into this program. Um, so the, 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 the people, it's a private company who built this algorithm, they were really keen for them not to be biased in there, right? They were really, really, really wanted to make it as fair as possible. So they said that anybody over, I think 80%, 
they could be referred to like their GP who could get them into the program. So there's like an appeal region. Um, they also, they checked, uh, they didn't use any um, categories for things like race or, um, or even categories for things that are correlated really well, uh, really strongly with race, like postcodes, that kind of thing. Um, and then they even checked whether the algorithm could make good predictions for different types of group uh, and that the, the mistakes they were making were the same mistake. I mean, they really tried, right? They tried a lot. Except that the problem was, is that to decide how sick someone is, you have to use a proxy. And the proxy that they decided to use was the amount of money that had been spent on an individual's healthcare in the previous 12 months. Now, I mean, this, this is like, when I say it out loud and I phrase it that way, it's so obvious that of course, that is gonna be something where certain groups have better access to more expensive healthcare yeah. than others, particularly yeah. in the face of the United States. And actually, once you use a different proxy, which I'm sure is biased in another way, um, uh, so the different proxy would be the number of chronic conditions, which yeah. doesn't yeah. talk about the severity, but then suddenly, of course, you know, actually, um, uh, uh, Black Americans and poor Americans um, are, you know, really uh, incredibly badly, um, badly treated by this particular algorithm. And I think that the, the thing that I think that the world is slowly coming to terms with, hopefully, um, is this idea that actually it's not, you know, being unbiased isn't a finish line that you get to cross. <laughs> you know? It's not like a, 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 a rubber stamp that you can put on something to say, great, well done, you did it, you made a perfectly fair system. That actually these are imperfect machines. Yeah. That the real question isn't necessarily about, um, about getting rid of the problems with them, but it's about making them as, as, as easy to appeal for when they inevitably go wrong. Is it also about thinking harder about the inputs? Because one of the things, I mean, women's health, a lot of doctors don't recognize that specific problems, endometriosis, for instance, is an absolutely crippling kind of thing. So if you ask doctors, how ill is this person? They will probably under mark that kind of thing. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think particularly with women's health, there are all kinds of biases. Yeah. And the thing is, is that data, papers on data, and databases and data sources and stuff it's just not very sexy you know it's like it's like the the replication crisis all over again really but it's the actually good quality data that is um that has uh you know these problems have been considered and carefully thought through um they don't really make the very sexy papers um but i think this is there's a um a group tim as one person who's leading a, a lot of the charge with this, um, I think that there is a move towards thinking much more about these problems much more deeply. Well, that is good because we are more and more dependent mm. on these in, in subtle and hidden ways that we don't know about, we the citizen. Um, so I should probably throw it open to Q&A. We have one comment about a specific video about ovarian cancer, the university released a, a, a big news story about ovarian cancer yes, yesterday, I think, this week, certainly. And I assume this is a link to it. But we have no other questions, please. Audience, we have a lot of you out there. Don't be frightened. Um, OK. Oh, there we go. Uh, given their great importance to the mathematicians of the future, what makes a good school maths teacher? From Matthew Donald. Good question. Um, okay, what makes a good school math teacher? Um, I think confidence is actually quite a big thing. I think, um, okay, so I, the one thing that I really remember about my math teacher um, was that she, um, I think that she hadn't got her full maths degree. She'd switched to a teaching degree halfway through. And so there were some things that she just felt very anxious about, really. I mean, she essentially had maths anxiety. Um, but what she was good at reassuring me on, um, and other people too, was that actually maths anxiety isn't something that goes away. <laughs> um, you know, so if you're in, if you're a young kid and you see a page of maths that you've never encountered before, and you get the sort of sharp intake of breath of like, oh God, it looks completely alien to me. Um, she was very good at reassuring us 
that um, that that happens to maths professors. And now that I am one, I can guarantee that that is absolutely true. <laughs> it's absolutely true. It doesn't go away. I think that Matt Parker, a very good friend of mine, mathematician, he says that um, mathematicians aren't the ones who find maths easy. They're the ones who enjoy how hard it is, <laughs> which I also really like. But so I think that that is that that for me, I think, is a really key point. It's about um, having the confidence to um, to uh, make your students feel comfortable with being uncomfortable, really. I think that's a really, really key idea is just is just the reassurance that it's not them, it's the subject. Um, I think that's a, that's a really key, key moment. So, I mean, the next question I'm going to read out, and I'm coming in quite thick and fast now, we may not get through them all, um, it, it's kind of related. What advice would you give a young woman student who wants to pursue a career in mathematics? Oh, I think if you are, at this moment, a young uh, female student, um, I mean, really, I think that that's your superpower. <laughs> like, I think that we're, in, I think that we're in a world where I think that people are um, elevating female mathematicians. I think that they are um, kind of going out of their way to support them. Um, and I think that I'm not saying everything's going to be really super easy. And I hope that things are yet to improve. I think over time there's still some way to go. But but I really think that actually having the confidence that that um, this is a that there has never been a better moment really to be I think a female in one of these careers um, should uh, compel you on. Um, the other thing I would say, um, but then maybe <laughs> maybe I'm only saying this now because I'm older. But but I would say don't let anyone patronise you. I think maybe get a few tricks up your sleeve. Um, and so one that I always say if somebody tries to um, patronise me. If someone that ever sort of talks down to me, uh, I will always say, could you say that again, but a bit more patronizing, um, which tends to sort of cut through things quite a bit. Um, I've heard somebody also uh, say when, <laughs> if somebody ever shouts at them, if like a, you know, they're in an environment where they're in, in a work environment, and someone starts shouting, um, they say, uh, I can see that you're getting emotional. Maybe we should take a, a five minute break for you to control your emotions. Which I just like, but I think having a few of those up your sleeve. I, you I, can... I need to write these down. I still yeah. sometimes get into these situations. <laughs> so let me, as I say, the question is coming thick and fast, and we're not going to get through them. Um, but let me change tack. This is a question from Diane Coyle, who is someone who I interviewed last year, I think, possibly when you dropped out on me uh, for very good reason. I mean, to be fair, <laughs> yes. Um, Policy makers are increasingly super keen on more data and bigger data. How would you think about introducing into their debate the kind of caution needed about the limitations on data and algorithms? Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yes, I agree. So I, I, I assume that when you're talking about policy makers here, I um, assume that you mean sort of uh, government policy makers. Um, so actually, I was involved in something um, in 2020, um, uh, which was a, a course for senior civil servants in order to try and get some of these messages out there. It involved, by the way, going into Downing Street the day before the Downing Street Christmas party and sitting in the garden. So I um, saw someone wheeling in a great big uh, wheel of brie. I was like, no, joking, that's not true. <laughs> um, but um, I think that there are, um, yes, I think, I think that it's, it's really important to try to as much as possible because I think that inevitably um, business sort of gets these ideas quite quickly um, and uh, notices the mistakes and the PR disasters quite quickly. And I think that sometimes it takes a little bit of time for um, those lessons to filter down. Um, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm trying, I guess, is the answer to it. I'm not trying. I mean, some of it is, of course, that there aren't enough STEM trained people in the civil service. I know the head of the data group is someone I taught 20 years ago, so I feel quite pleased about that. <laughs> you may have met her. Um, let's change tack again. This is a question from Helen. What are the key skills to communicate research effectively to your audience who are from all walks of life? 
did TV people ask you to talk or behave in a certain way in front of the camera? <laughs> okay, so um, uh, the tips of how to communicate with your audience. Okay, so the first thing I would say is that it doesn't matter how technically minded you are or how new to these subjects you are, people like stories. Everybody always likes stories. So if you can wrap up an idea in a story, it will always land better than if you just say what the idea is. But the second thing I think is a recognition that um, when you're communicating with an audience, it's about what your audience wants, not what you want to tell them. So what you have to do in your mind is you have to work out where they are and you have to work out where you want them to get to and then plot a path where you bring them with you. I know that sounds like I'm saying some things like I've said, but like, okay, so let's say that I, I, so I have a slot on Six Music every week with Lauren Laverne where I go on and talk about something sciencey. So let's say I wanted to talk about binary numbers one week. I wouldn't just go on and talk about binary numbers. I would talk about, um, uh, you know, maybe the uh, example where you have poisoned bottles of wine and not enough tests, um, or, uh, you know, or, or I think that there's a, I'm slightly, <laughs> I'm not using an example that I've actually done on Lauren Avern now, so <laughs> like, but the, um, don't Google this and find out that I'm wrong, but I think that they used to test the syphilis by mixing uh, vials of blood. Um, in a binary fashion in order to minimize the number of tests that they needed to use. So I would do something like that. I would tell some kind of story that captures the imagination of everybody. And then it, so it's the thing that I want to deliver then feels like a secret key that you need to unlock the next part of the story um, rather than the other way around. I think that's the big secret. Um, in terms of how I, uh, what was it, how I looked or what was it? Uh, yeah, do, do they tell you how to behave in front of the camera? Okay, Radio 4, I, I'm actually, I know it sounds like I'm quite posh, but I'm really not. So my dad worked in a factory and I, I was born in Essex. So, um, but Radio 4, I think I talked a bit more like that, right? When I was like a bit younger. Um, <laughs> and Radio 4, not now for me, <laughs> that happened. Um, and then also um, they did, the, an executive producer from the BBC did come around my house and look in my wardrobe and tell me what clothes I wasn't allowed to wear. There was a bit of a joke that I had a thing for cardigans, which I still do. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> so okay. a little bit. They told Lucy Worsley to take out her hair clip. Oh, I'm so glad I don't appear on TV. Um, so one last question. I know you've got a flight to catch, so we need to wrap up. What do you see being the most dangerous bias in algorithm-based systems in the near future? Oh, I think it's automation bias. So I think it's the the idea that actually, um, uh, and I think this is present in everybody, really. I think it's the idea that actually somehow the output of a machine has an air of authority around it um, that it doesn't necessarily deserve. I think that you see this in really trivial ways with people, I don't know, believing their sat nav and like driving off a cliff. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but I think that it's actually, you see it in much more serious ways too, much more pernicious ways where people are introducing algorithms um into systems where they haven't been validated they haven't been scientifically evaluated and they can't do what they're claiming to be able to do like for example those algorithms that say that they can tell what your emotion is it's absolute junk complete junk based on terrible terrible scientific ideas that have been totally and completely debunked but somehow because an algorithm is saying it uh it it, it, it ends up um ends up taking on this area of authority and i think that that's really dangerous Excellent. Well, thank you so much. We've covered a huge amount of ground. It's very superficially, of course, I could talk to you for hours, but you do have a flight to catch. I'm sorry to everyone who, who put questions in and we didn't have time. There are a lot left that we just couldn't cover. It's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you so much and good luck with all your health. What a treat. Thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm.